Um, hi, uh, my name is Andrew Durand and I work at uh, Google Sydney on the Go programming language. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about Go. I'm going to introduce the language and talk about uh, the design philosophy and how that's affected the design of tools and libraries um, and the language itself. Um, so how, uh, for people here, some of you were in the tutorial yesterday. Yeah. How many of you was that? It was like quite a few. So I'm not going to be like recovering a lot of the ground of that tutorial. Um, so this should still be of interest to you. Um, so of the people here, how many of you, aside from the tutorial attendees, have actually used Go before? All right, yeah, I recognize you. Um, what about uh, who's like looked at it but not really used it? A few. Okay, and so what sort of languages do you guys usually write in? Any C programmers? Um, Java programmers? PHP, Python, JavaScript, anything else? Like yell out, what do you, what do you go? Ruby, yep. Ruby, Ruby. Perl. I always forget Perl. I should never forget Perl. Scala. Scala, cool. Great. Um, so, all right. Well, let's get started. So I'll just start off with a bit of background about where Go came from and why it exists. So uh, at Google, our canonical languages were Java, Python, and C++. And you get a lot of, uh, there's a pr pretty diverse range of stuff across those three. Um, we also write, write a lot of JavaScript. Um, <coughs> but we were sort of stuck in this uh, position where to do things that require a lot of efficiency, you would use C++. Um, and then for a subset of those problems, you might be able to use Java. Um, but, th but those languages tend to be very verbose um, and quite fussy. Um, and, and in the case of C++, it's very easy to make mistakes um, that are very difficult to detect. And so it's easy to blow your, your own feet off um, and, and uh, create big problems without even realizing. Or in Java's case, um, you end up writing a lot of code uh, or a lot of, uh, a lot of text to do not, not that very much. And then on the other side of this kind of chasm, you have a language like Python where it's very productive and you can get a lot done. Uh, but the, the, it doesn't perform very well at runtime. Um, it has pretty poor concurrency properties. Um, and also it's, so it's, it's strength in its productivity and sort of malleability is also one of its main flaws. When you're dealing with thousands of programmers and hundreds or millions uh, of lines of code, um, Python just doesn't scale and JavaScript has the same problem. So the dynamism which gives it its sort of productiveness is also its, its failing in some ways. And so we thought, why can't we have a language that is fun to use and a language that we can get a lot of work done in, but that doesn't, um, doesn't uh, sacrifice on, on efficiency, that we still have control over what the machine is doing, it's still have visibility into the performance characteristics of the code that we're writing. And also a, a language that has... Uh, a good uh, concurrency model that makes it easier to to write concurrent code because a lot of the code that we write at Google and a lot of the code that's written today is for um, solving concurrent problems um, on multiple machines and so on and network machines and so we were in this position of speed reliability or simplicity pick two um, but we thought let's have all three so Go is a modern general purpose language. Um, it's not like a, a fancy language that language nerds will really get psyched about because it has a lot of uh, a lot of things that have been around for a long time. It's more the combination of things and the things that we left out that make Go what it is. Um, so it's a language that compiles to native machine code on a variety of platforms. Um, it's a statically typed language, but unlike a lot of statically typed language languages, you don't spend a lot of time wrestling with the type system. Um, it has a lightweight syntax that feels like a scripting language, so it's a very productive language. Um, and it also has some neat concurrency primitives, which I'll talk about in a minute. So the basic tenets of, of the design of Go, the language, is that each feature in the language should be simple and easy to understand in isolation. And then the, the features should also be orthogonal, so that when they're combined, um, they behave in predictable and consistent ways. So it's easy to understand um, how your code will behave once you've written it. 
And finally, and this falls into the other two, um, readability. Um, you spend a way more time reading other people's code or even reading your own code than you do writing code. So readability was one of the key uh, criteria for a lot of the design decisions in building Go and its libraries. So in theory, when reading Go code, you should be able to understand exactly what is happening um, without needing a whole lot of extra context, um, which is surprisingly not true of a lot of languages. So here's a quote um, from Rob Pike. He said, the consensus drove the design. Nothing went into the language until we all agreed that it was right. And some features didn't get resolved until after a year or more of discussion. So it meant that everything that made it into the language went through this kind of prolonged, agonizing period of, of should we do it this way? Is it going to work? And so as a result, you know, some, some things uh, are still not, that, still not in the language. Um, and I think that's, that's to its benefit rather than its detriment. So uh, the sort of topic of this talk is that Go is simple. And this sort of this philosophy of simplicity permeates um, the language, the libraries, and the tools, and then therefore the code that people write in Go. So Go code is succinct. Um, it's not overly wordy, um, but it's not sort of obfuscated. It's not, um, it doesn't let you cram a whole lot of functionality into one line. Um, but uh, so you, you sometimes tend to write more code in Go than you would to, uh, to do the same thing in, in Python or Perl. Um, but the, the readability benefit for that is the trade-off there. Um, and Go's APIs and interfaces tend to be small but general, um, not the kind of mega configurable APIs that are like Swiss Army knives that can do anything for you. And so it all sort of follows the Unix philosophy that things should do one thing and that they should do that thing well. Um, and I think we've done a pretty good job so far. So this is a piece of, uh, of Go code. It's Hello World. It's five lines. Um, you have a, a package <laughs> definition. All Go code belongs to a package. Um, and main is where all executables begin. Um, there's an import statement importing Fumpt, which is a string formatting package. And then you have a main function which calls <coughs> the print line function from the formatting package to print um, Hello World. And the, the Chinese characters for world there are included to demonstrate that all Go source files are UTF-8 um, and even identifiers in Go can contain Unicode characters um, and so uh, and Go strings are Unicode strings. Um, here's a slightly longer Hello World, it's Hello World 2.0, it's a web server. <coughs> um, we now also import the HTTP package um, and we have a handler function that uh, that simply calls fprint to write hello and then part of the URL path to the uh, to the web response. Um, in our main, uh, we call the handler the handle func function from the HTTP package to register our handler with a global HTTP mux, and then we call listen and serve to start a, a web server listening on port 8080. Um, and so if you visit uh, localhost 8080 slash world while running that code, um, you'll see hello world. So yeah, again, that's maybe 10 lines of code and pretty straightforward. So I'll just talk a bit about um, Go's type system. Um, so Go, as I mentioned, is a statically typed language, but it has a form of type inference that saves you from doing a lot of typing um, and a lot of repetition. So in Java, in this slightly contrived example, you might say something like that. Um, to declare a, a, an object, integer is a kind of naive one. But in C and C++, you still have to say int something. But in Go, uh, you can declare i to be equal to 1. Uh, and the type that it's an integer is, is inferred from the initial value. Um, and this extends all the way through to more complex types. So examples, ints, floats, strings. Point. This is a user-defined type, um, so it has a, this variable pt is of type point, and uh, finally mul is a is a function that will multiply two, multiply its arguments and return an integer, and so that will have a function type, and it would be a pain to type out uh, that function uh, type signature every time you wanted to use a type of this um, kind. Um, in Go. 
you can define user-defined types. So this is the point from the previous slide. Um, it has two, um, two fields, X and Y, both float 64 values. Um, and you can define methods on any type. Uh, so we don't have classes in Go. Instead, you just use types. And you can define a method by, it's just a function definition with a receiver before the, the function name. And so the receiver in this case is point, and it calculates the, uh, the magnitude of the point, I suppose, if it were a vector. Um, and then you can see this code in use here. We can declare a new point, P, and then uh, call the abs method on, on P and get the predictable result. Um, but when I say that you can define methods on any type, I mean like any type. It doesn't just have to be structs. Um, if you declare a type um, that is, uh, my, in this case, my float, um, and all it is is a float64, you can declare a method on that, uh, on that type. And so, uh, in this case, the abs method will give you the uh, absolute magnitude of a float. Um, and, uh, and so it means that there's, there's, all we're doing essentially is, is a, a, attaching functionality um, to a particular type signature, but it's not uh, wrapped up in the sort of the complexity of, of class-based object orientism. Even though you do get objects, um, so there's no kind of box, there's no extra sort of overhead uh, involved in in um, turning pure data into data with functionality. Um, so in memory, this is just stored as a float64, but you can still call methods on it and in, the, in this slide, the point is just two float 64s in memory, but it has uh, it has functionality attached to it. Whereas if, say, in Java or Python, there's an actually not insignificant overhead um, to making a class and attaching methods to that class for every instance of that class. Um, and so that's that's the type system, and that's that's almost all there is to it. It's actually very simple. Um, the other, the other part to the type system is interfaces. And these are the things that give Go its kind of dynamic feel. Um, it lets you mix and match things and, and feel a lot more like a scripting language. And what an interface is, is a type that defines a set of methods. And here we have an example, the ABSA interface, which includes one method signature, ABS, which returns a flow 64. And then any type, that implements that method, apps, implements the apps method. So the pr two previous slides, the code on both those slides, simply because the point and my float uh, implement an apps method of that signature, they become an apps in the context of an apps And so it means that we don't have to go back and write uh, my, my float type implements apps when I declare it. It means that at the point of use, where you use something as interface, that's where the interface matters. And so I can have this function print apps that takes an absa, and then I can pass in a my float or a point, and I don't have to make any modifications to the code on either of these slides. Um, and so this kind of this kind of implicit implementation of interfaces allows you to do a kind of um, compile time duck typing, where uh, you might not realize that you want to abstract something until later, and you might not even have control over the code that you need to um, abstract. And so if, if a type walks like a duck and speaks like a duck, then you can use it as a duck, and there's, there's no problem there. Um, to give you a concrete example of um, how this becomes useful, uh, there's an I.O. package in the standard library that defines um, a writer interface. It also defines a reader interface. Um, but the writer interface contains just the one method, um, write, um, and it takes a, a byte buffer, like a, an array of bytes essentially, and returns the number of bytes that it wrote and um, an error if there's a, an error value. So another detail, Go functions can return multiple values as well as taking multiple arguments. Um, but there are many write implementations throughout the standard library and throughout other Go code, um, but they all all they do is implement this write method. Um, and in fact, we've already seen an example of uh, the writer in action in our, um, in the HTTP hello world example I showed, um, the handler function prints a string um, to a response writer um, by using the fprint function. 
And the first argument of fprint is a um, I/O writer, the, the interface value, and this response writer, which which is the object that writes a re an HTTP response back to an end user, um, implements this write method, and therefore uh, can be used as an I/O writer. But the the formatting package and the HTTP package know nothing about each other. Um, there's no relationship there. And similarly, neither of them needs to needs to include the I/O package either. Um, but it all they all satisfy the same behavior, and therefore they can be used interchangeably. Um, and this is a, this becomes an incredibly powerful thing. I'll just say a bit about packages. Um, Go code is organized into packages, as I mentioned. Um, and a package is just a collection of declarations, constants, variables, functions, and types. Um, and packages can span multiple files. So uh, they, you can have a, a package that consists of half a dozen different files, each of which has many different declarations inside them. Um, and then they all just get built into the one package. And so you're able to um, more loosely group um, uh, uh, units of functionality into sort of larger bits. It's kind of similar to the way you might um, organize code in Python, except in Python you tend to stick everything in the one file. Um, but the, the neat thing is that all the code inside a package can see all of the declarations within that package. Um, and it means that related code inside a package can see all the internal details of the other parts of the package. Um, and it, so it makes it easy to, to rearrange and refactor code and to create and uh, avoids the need of having to, say in Java you end up with these classes that have a bunch of static methods that are just functions that just do sort of random oddball things. Um, but you don't need to do that in Go, you just stick it in a, in a relevant package and it all fits all together quite nicely. Um, uh, in Go, the way visibility is, is handled in terms of um, providing an interface from a package is we don't say that something is private or public. Um, there's no keyword to that effect. Instead, um, there's the concept of something being exported. Um, and so a name is considered exported and therefore visible outside the package if it begins with a capital letter. And that's the only uh, necessary criteria for that. So uh, any identifier that doesn't begin with a capital letter is therefore um, part of a pr part of the package's private uh, implementation details and not visible to any other code. And so you can see immediately at a glance whether a particular piece of code is uh, part of an interface or not. Um, and that tends to make it really easy to, to understand what's going on when you're reading the code. Um, in this example, I have this math package, which is obviously a very underfeatured math package, um, which has an internal constant pi, um, and then it has a function pi that returns that constant. It's not actually code that you would really write. But uh, in my package foo that imports the math package, um, this function is invalid because I'm trying to access the lowercase pi, um, but this function is, is valid because I'm accessing a, an exported function, part of the math package, package's interface. Um, if you have questions during, I can probably answer them. Um, I think I, I think I will have time. So if it's confusing, or am I going too fast? Is it all right? Cool. Yes? No? All right. Just keep going. So um, I, I have a, there's a number of sections, so I think it should all be covered well. Um, so I mentioned that Go has support for concurrency, um, and it's quite nice. Uh, if you think about the Unix model, um, it's it's the the idea of you have processes that are connected by pipes, um, and so you can. Uh, if I wanted to find all the um, test files in the Go standard library. I might execute a find and then pipe it through grep and then uh, pipe that into exargs that will invoke a word count function on all those files. Um, and every tool uh, in that process is designed to do the one thing and then to do it well. Um, in Go, the analog is that you have Go routines that are joined together with channels. And so what's a Go routine? A Go routine is like a operating system thread um, and the traditional notion of threads um, in that they share memory with other Go routines. Um, all the Go routines in a particular process share the same memory space. Um, but they're cheaper than operating system threads 
because they have smaller segmented stacks. Um, each go routine weighs in at about 4K. Um, and if the stack grows, um, it can grow organically. And so you can, you can grow the stack up until you run out of heat. Um, and the, in terms of it, operationally, um, you have many go routines per operating system thread in your program. So you might have as many OS threads as there are processors in your machine. Um, so you have CPU parallelism. But then the Go routines are scheduled concurrently across those threads by the Go runtime. Um, and so to start a Go routine, you just use the Go keyword. And so uh, in this code, kind of artificial code, I have a slice S. I have a pivot function that chooses some point in the slice, an index. And then I launch two Go routines that sort uh, the left-hand side of the slice and the right-hand side of the slice. Um, and so they should sort this thing concurrently. So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's really go routines and that's it. That's how straightforward it is. Um, but what, what do I, the other part of the, the other part of the go concurrency story is channels. Um, and channels are a typed conduit for synchronization and communication. So two related but distinct things. Um, and channels work with the channel operator which you use to send and receive values through channels. Um, and so in this very contrived example, I have a main function that creates a channel of ints using the built-in make function, um, stores the channel in CH, and then I, I launch the compute function in a new Go routine using the Go keyword, um, and I give it the channel. And then I perform a receive on the channel and store the value in result. And so in my compute function, um, I call some other function that does something expensive um, that I want to do somewhere else and then send the result to um, CH. And so uh, I'll have my main function running in the main Go routine, which exists when programs start, and then I have my compute function that's running in a new Go routine, and then the channel uh, transports the value through the channel from, um, from CH uh, to the result variable there. And the, an important thing to note is that the send is synchronous. So um, this line here will wait until uh, evaluating this expression until there is a value to be sent on the other side of the channel. And similarly, if, the, if something happened before this line um, and, and there was some processing happening here, um, this send here would wait until there was a receiver available on the other side. So if we think back to the sort example I had a couple of slides ago, um, we had these two sort functions that were going, um, and so I need to somehow know when they're done. And we can use channels to synchronize that. Um, in this example, I have a done um, channel that I create. It's just a channel of, of Boolean values. It could be a channel of any kind of value. It's not really important what the value is. Um, and then I create this closure here um, do sort that takes a slice or a, an, an array and uh, sorts that slice and then sends a value true um, to the channel done. Um, and then back, this is, this is looking more like the code that we saw before, um, we pick the pivot and then launch two do sort um, closures in new go routines. So we're sorting two different parts of the slice in different go routines. And meanwhile, in the main Go routine, I do two receives from the channel done. And so the first receive will happen when, whenever the first of those sort functions completes. And then the second one will happen when the other one is complete. And so I know that by the time I get to the end of this code here, that both sorts have, have happened. Yeah? There's no way of knowing which one of them is responded. No. Well, in this case, I, I don't know which, uh, which one is, has completed. Yep. Um, but I could know that if, um, I had a channel of some value, and then they indicated which, which one was coming back, or I could give each of them a separate um, channel and then receive from each one independently, and then I could guarantee the ordering. Okay, you replace true. Rather than make the channel really in, you can make it an int. I can make it an int and send yeah. one for the first up and two for the second or so on. Sorry, what are the last two ones? So these are just receives from the channel done. Right. And so it means that this line won't continue 
until at least one of these sorts is completed and sent. And so it's like a thunk. It's a way of saying, wait here for something to happen, and when it does, it can continue. You don't have to use the other special underscore variable to, um, in that case? Yeah, so it's just the other variable. So that's, that's how you can use channels to synchronize. So the important thing to note here is that it doesn't matter what the value I'm sending is, it's, it's about the, um, the synchronization from the send side to the receive side. Does it wait for anything to come down the channel, or it has to be a, a true... No, it just waits for anything. I could be sending false there, it would be the same. And when the true, or you're sending an integer, where does it go? Um, well, this, this is an expression that is evaluated, and so if I assigned the value of that to right. something, or if I pass that expression into a function. So it throws it away. And so in this case, it throws it away. On this slide, we store the result in this result variable here. Okay, cut. So you said the synchronization is, um, it's, um, it's serial, is that right? It, is, it just happens in this block, oh, yeah, right. It's synchronous. Because yeah. oh, block, sorry, can you do it over the blocks. internet? Sorry, it blocks, yeah. yeah. Can you do it over the internet? Uh, no. Away. No. This is this is purely within a process. There's no kind of magical networking stuff happening so here at all. Also that's that's a that's a whole other thing entirely. If you wanted to use channels and go routines in a cluster kind of process, you'd have to write um, application level stuff to handle that. But yeah, yeah, it's not it's not like in in Erlang you might have the the concept of like. Uh, VMs that know about each other and can run code in anywhere. Go is not that kind of language. This all happens within the one process. Um, so the other, the other use of channels, or the, the sort of the complementary use, is um, is through is communicating values. So you can send values through a channel, and uh, it has some significance. So if you imagine uh, in a traditional um, kind of worker thread scenario in a traditional threading context. Um, you might have um, tasks that need to be completed, some kind of um, data structure, and then you might have a pool of those tasks, which contains a lock and a collection of tasks or a list of list of those tasks. Um, and then you have a worker that uh, that has a reference to the pool, and the worker loops forever, um, taking the lock of the pool looking through the list of tasks and choosing one, takes it out of the list, mutating that data, and then releases the lock. Does the work somewhere, and then, uh, and then when it's finished, um, it might take the lock again and put the thing back in the pool or whatever. Um, but it means that in this piece of code here, this is just me dealing with this task pool, and this is the actual processing of the task. And it's kind of unwieldy. It, re it requires you to do it correctly, or um, everything falls apart, um, and it can be very difficult to reason about once it gets more complex. Um, but in an idiomatic Go style, you would have um, a task, uh, some task type, and then what your worker would do instead is, uh, instead of looking at a pool, it just has two channels, an input channel and an output channel, and they're both channels of type um, task, so they, they take a, a reference to a task a pointer to a task. And they just loop forever, um, receiving tasks from this in channel, uh, processing that task, and then sending the processed task to the output channel to be dealt with somewhere else. Um, and so to feed that, you might have, you, you create two channels in this main function, pending and done, um, and then you launch a go routine that calls some send work function that generates these tasks, reading them from a file or from a network or from clients or whatever. And then, uh, so this pending channel has a bunch of tasks being sent on it. And then we launch 10 Go routines um, that run this worker function, and we pass them the pending and done channels. And then we finally have this consume work function, which will receive um, completed bits of work from uh, the workers as it's done. And so it means that uh, all the code that we have here is directly related to to the flow of information, and uh, but it, it means that the worker gets to be a lot more naive, and it means that every every piece along the chain um, just gets to be concerned with what it's actually doing, and less with uh, 
synchronizing things. It, all of that is just handled by the channels and the go runtime itself. So the, the basic, and to summarize, um, go routines give you the efficiency of a kind of a synchronous model where um, a lot of different things can be happening simultaneously, but then they're synchronized with channels. And so you can write your code in a synchronous style, not in sort of a callback driven style, um, and not in a, uh, in a mutex oriented style. Um, but you get the, the speed of, the, of an asynchronous model, um, but the ease of programming of the synchronous style. Um, and so with channels, it's a lot easier to reason about complex concurrent systems. You just write parts that run in Go routines that do specific things well and then connect them together with channels. Um, so in practice, we found that it, it makes it a lot simpler and um, a lot easier to write uh, maintainable concurrent code using this paradigm. And the, the sort of, the philosophy can be summarized in that you don't communicate by sharing memory. You share memory by communicating about it. So previously, in this example, we were um, communicating by sharing this pool between a bunch of different workers. But instead, uh, in an idiomatic style, in a Go style, we share the memory by passing pointers to different parts of memory around. And when a, when a worker passes the pointer out, it means that it's saying, here, you deal with this now. And it's a lot simpler to, to think in those <coughs> kinds of terms. So I'll talk a bit about Go's tools. Um, and we have, there's a bunch of tools in the Go standard library. Um, the, the one you probably meet first is Go test. Um, it's a simple testing framework. Um, it lets you write tests in Go. Um, and so your tests use um, your code in the same way that the users of your code will. And so you write tests as if you're just using your libraries. Um, and so it means you don't need to learn any kind of domain-specific testing language. And it means that if you, uh, when you need it, the full power of the Go language is there to um, write more complex tests. And so during testing, the tests um, build uh, sorry, the typo. The test build is part of the, the package itself. Um, and so it means that you can test the internals of a package because you can see into the internals, um, but you don't have to write like hooks to, to uh, expose the internals of your package. You can just like call directly into them. And so this copy function um, is part of the, the IO packages test suite, and it just creates um, two memory buffers and then writes a string to one buffer, and then this is the, the meat of it, we're, we're called invoking the function that's being tested, the copy function, copying from the, the read buffer to the write buffer, and then we check that the string representation of the write buffer equals the, the, uh, the input string, hello world, and uh, if it doesn't, then we issue an error um, using this uh, testing object. And so this, this is literally what's in the, the file, and GoTest just um, builds the package with these tests inside it and then invokes each of the functions that begins with the, the word test um, in sequence. And so you end up with um, uh, a, f a file full of tests that's just nothing but, but Go code. It's very simple, it's very easy to use. Um, and so when you find yourself doing um, really repetitive testing, Go has uh, really nice support for just defining ad hoc um, anonymous data structures. So this global variable um, index tests um, is a, a slice of structs, and each of those structs has, um, we're testing the, the, the strings index function, a function that finds the index of a substring inside of a string. And so it takes s, which is the, the, the haystack, um, and set, which is the, the substring to be, te to be found, and then out is the result of that index function. So we just have a, a list of those cases here, um, and and uh, there are many, many entries in the real test. But then inside the testing function itself, and we just iterate through those tests, um, call the index function, check that the output e is equal to what we expect. If it's not, then we call the error apt method of our testing object, and uh, that will report to the Go test framework that, uh, that a test has failed, and then the appropriate outputs are sent. So that's go test, um, and that's pretty much what go test is, um, in a nutshell. 
Go documentation is handled by GoDoc, um, and it extracts docs straight from Go source code. It's got command line interfaces and web interfaces. Um, the golang.org website is entirely powered by a GoDoc instance that runs on App Engine. Um, and documentation for GoDoc is just written as a plain comment on the function type variable or whatever it is that it's documenting. Um, so there's no special format to doc the documentation that GoDoc uses. Um, and it's not a part of the language. It's not like um, in Python where you actually have strings embedded in your code. Um, and it's not heavyweight like Javadoc where you have this special format that everything needs to conform to. Instead, um, this is from the IO package again, the closer interface. It just has a comment before the, the function. Closer is the interface that wraps the basic close method. And then uh, Godoc in the web form just uh, outputs that documentation um, exactly like that. And so it means that uh, you, write, you can write and read your documentation alongside the code that it documents. It makes it much easier to keep code up to date. I probably don't need to extol the virtues of documenting in line. You probably all know what I'm talking about. And one other sweet thing about GoDoc, and this is also part of GoTest, is that if you include a function in your tests that begins with example and then follows with a, uh, a, an identifier name, so this is example hints, it's a code example for the ints function of the sort package. And it demonstrates setting up a slice, sorting that slice, and printing the result. And so the comment on this example is the expected output of this example. And so in the web interface, um, if you press this little arrow, it expands to this, and you see the, a bit of example code, how to use this ints function, and then you see the expected output of that function. And furthermore, when you run go test, it actually executes each of these functions and checks that the output is what you expect it to be. And so you get um, fully um, testable and therefore maintainable example code um, and example documentation, which is uh, really, really handy. Um, Go install is another tool, um, and it automatically installs packages and their dependencies. So a package can be an executable or it can be a library. Um, and the way it, it uh, locates um, uh, packages is via the import paths, and the import paths uh, are a one-to-one -one map to the uh, repository where they live. So if you wanted to import Go's protobuf package, you would import it uh, at, from goprotobuf.googlecode.com slash etc. Um, similarly, there's a Go MySQL package at that, at that URL, and so in your code, you just have these import statements. And go install will, um, with one command, um, read, read those um, import statements and then recursively fetch these repositories using Git or Mercurial or Bazaar or Subversion. And so, for example, I have this IceCloud package. Um, and so when I, when I issue go install github.com slash nsicloud, um, it will fetch the Git repository from, from that GitHub repo. Um, and then it finds this import line where I'm importing this package for interacting with Amazon's EC2. Um, and then it will fetch that package from uh, using Bazaar. And then it builds and install, it installs EC2, and then it builds and installs IceCloud. And then, it's, and then you end up with a binary. And all this happens very quickly. Um, it also uses tags that are associated with the various Go versions to handle versioning pretty transparently. And so it's just a collection of conventions um, and so I hope you know you can kind of see how this is trying to take the configuration and the sort of writing metadata files and all that kind of stuff out of, of sharing code. And it seems to be working um, really well. And so the, the last tool I'll talk about um, is GoFix, which is my favorite. Um, GoFix, uh, it finds Go programs that use old APIs and rewrites them to use the new ones. So Go's been around for a couple of years um, in the public, and in that time we've discovered like mistakes, like maybe some APIs are more complex than they need to be, other ones um, just need to be rearranged in some fashion. Um, and so Go fixes like Python's two to three on steroids. It means that any time that we make some um, backwards incompatible API change, we can just write a Go fix module, and Go fix will read in the code, rewrite it. And then uh, 
and then it just works most of the time. I mean, it, it's impossible for it to be... There are some cases where you just can't make the right choice, and so it either inserts a comment in your code and leaves it in a broken state so you can inspect it and fix it, um, or it doesn't do anything, and lets the compiler tell you about it. So the fixes range from really trivial things to just like moving packages. Like we recently did a big package reorganization and, and moved a whole bunch of stuff in the standard library around to make it a bit more um, logical and consistent because it had grown in a kind of wild and woolly way. Um, and so we moved JSON to encoding JSON and then we just uh, run GoFix and it does that. Um, another more hairy example is we uh, refactored the um, Go's reflection package um, which involved changing a lot of the interface in a really drastic way. We wrote GoFix modules to fix it, and it was able to make these kinds of really strange changes. And there's a lot of... Uh, I wouldn't expect you guys to even understand what's going on in this code snippet. Um, it's kind of hairy enough as it is as a concept, but using GoFix, we were able to do it correctly 99% of the time. And it's really good for me, because part of my job is to maintain all of the Go code that's written at Google, which is a sizable amount of code. And I've actually got a tool that recursively tries to build everything, and when it finds breakages, it Go fixes the code, and then tries again, and so on and so forth. So usually, when it's time to update the Google code, I just type in a thing, come back in a couple of hours, and almost everything's fixed. It's like the best thing ever. <laughs> so I'll just, give a, a, um, I'll just give a few quick examples of... Um, Ghost, from Ghost Standard Library and how our sort of design choices are, are erring on the side of simplicity. Um, Ghost Standard Library is um, quite diverse. It ranges from crypto stuff to encodings to archival formats to HTTP to other networking stuff. In fact, um, I can show you the package list. So, you know, zip, buffered IO, compression, um, container types, a lot of crypto. Um, a lot of different encodings, uh, stuff for reading and writing Go code itself, um, imaging, HTML parsing, templating packages, etc. Um, and um, we're constantly developing it, um, and it's it's really improving all the time. And um, it's it's really in the last couple of years it's become quite sweet, if I do say so myself. Um, not that it's all my work. But uh, we also have a lot of external library support, and that Go install tool that I talked about, it actually lists more than 200 packages at the package dashboard. And so it shows you the most popular packages by their import paths, and you can see recently installed packages as well as um, the most installed packages of all time. Um, and I even have a continuous builder that shows you which packages are currently building against the current release version of Go. So you can see at a glance like what builds and what's good. So that's also pretty nice. Um, I'll just talk a bit about Go's JSON package. So uh, everyone uses JSON all the time. Who here doesn't use JSON all the time? Like two people. So um, I really like the way JSON works. It's similar to how we do things like XML and other data types. But basically you just have a Go, uh, a Go struct and you can call um, JSON marshal, and it will just marshal that into the corresponding JSON object. Um, and then if you want to unmarshal, you just create a, a new, um, allocate a new uh, value of that type, and then pass in a pointer to unmarshal, and it will just unmarshal the field straight into your Go data structure. And so it's, it's, uh, it's total, it's very, feels very native and very natural. Um, and so to give you an example of using JSON in action, um, when working on Go install, we wanted to support Bitbucket specifically, um, but Bitbucket allowed, recently introduced Git support. Previously, it was always Mercurial, and so a given Bitbucket path may or may not be Git. Um, and so, fortunately, they have an API, and so you hit this API, and it gives you info about the the uh, the, pa the package, and then it's got this SCM field that tells you which one it uses. Um, and so, I added a function to go install that just looks up the repo and makes an API call um, using an HTTP GET request. And then I have this little ad hoc structure here, response. It's a response variable that's a struct with an SCM field. And I just uh, 
create a JSON decoder that reads from the response body and read that response directly off the wire, straight off the network connection into my Go data structure. And then I can just return that SCM field um, and a nil error because nothing's gone wrong. And so it's really, really straightforward. Um, we've already seen a bit of the HTTP package, um, but I'm, I'll just give you another example of um, creating HTTP handlers. Um, and so, as I mentioned, like the HTTP package has a central muxer, which you can register paths with. So you register a handler with a given path. Um, and so if you, you call the handle function to register a handler object, or handle func to register a handler function, um, and then this means that packages from many independent packages can register HTTP handlers without needing to know about each other or pass through some, anything other than the base HTTP package itself. And so the example I'll give is that um, we serve golang.org with a Go program on App Engine. Um, and recently somebody said, hey, can we have these shortcuts so that if you go to golang.org slash change slash some ID, or slash issue slash some ID, or slash CL slash some ID, you get a you get the the change page or the issue page or the code review page. And I was like, yeah, I can do that. And in five minutes, I'd written this package that I just linked straight into the Godoc instance, um, which has uh, some helpers defined as a map of the of the shortcut name to the to the long URL. And then I have this init function that runs at startup that just uh, for each helper in that range, it makes a redirect handler with this function passing in the, the prefix and the redirect URL, and then it registers that uh, handler with the handle func under that prefix. And the, the actual code that makes the redirect handler is a function that returns a handler function. So this redirect handler takes the prefix in the URL and then it creates a new function that encloses the prefix in the URL. So it's a full closure. And that the handler that it's created um, grabs the ID from the end of the path, um, checks that it's valid with a regex. If it's not, it issues a 404. I mean, if it is valid, it uses a redirect helper to send an HTTP redirect instead. And so that was that's like 15 lines of code, and it all just it all just worked. It was very very simple. Very straightforward, and closures are nice too. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about networking as well. Um, the net package in Go provides a really simple API for accessing the network. Uh, it totally encapsulates sockets, and we've managed to kind of abstract away a lot of the nastiness involved in that. Um, if you wanted to, if you want to connect to something, you use dial, and you can dial TCP or UDP or um, some other protocols as well. And if you want to listen, uh, you just say net.listen on TCP port 2000, for example, and then you can just loop forever accepting connections um, on, on that port. Um, and the nice thing is that the, the return con is a net.con, and that's, uh, that implements the IO read write closer, which is an IO reader, an IO writer, and an IO closer. And those are the same interfaces that you get from a file from the OS package or that you get from anything that implements some kind of streaming interface. So it means that you can use all the functions that expect these uh, I.O. interfaces, um, regardless of whether it's a net connection or a file or anything else. Uh, so a quick example. Um, I wrote a program called Go Go for D. It's a, uh, a Go for server written in Go. I don't think there are any deployments of it, but it, was, it sort of had to be done. Um, and in its main function, this is pretty much the whole main function. There's actually some command line flags as well for the configuration, but this is stripped back a little bit. It just listens on port 70. If it encounters an error, it logs a fatal error and bails. And then just loops forever, accepting connections on that, on that port. If an error occurs, it means that the socket's shut down and we need to shut down the server anyway. And then once it was served, once it, for each connection that it receives, it launches a Go routine that serves um, that request. And so this Go routine goes off and serves the connection, and meanwhile, we're ready to accept the next connection. Yeah. So is this the stat sort of Go idiom for the C selects kind of loop? Uh, yeah, pretty much, yes. Um, except, no. not, not select really, because, no, because select you're, you're writing code that's, that serves sockets asynchronously. 
But here we just sort of have Go routines that deal with sockets synchronously. Yeah. So yeah, this is like your your Apache uh, pre fork stuff that will just accept and fork a new process to serve the request. Except because we're launching Go routines instead of forking a process, it's way 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 cheaper, and you can have millions of simultaneous connections if you like, if you've got enough RAM that is. Um, but the actual serve um, function itself, it takes a network connection. The first thing it does is use the defer keyword, which I haven't talked about. But that just means that when the function returns at any point, the close method will be called, so the connection gets shut down. And then uh, I use fscanline, so I'm using like fscan to read straight off the network connection, like reading straight off the wire. I read a path into a string. Um, if it's an invalid path for some reason, um, I can write the error using fprint, um, and this error function just formats a, a gopher protocol error response. Um, I've omitted the part that does the directory listings, because that's a bit too complex to talk about here. Um, but then, if I'm just going to serve a file, I just grab the file name um, by uh, sanitizing the input path with the file path that clean, uh, um, prepending the root to it, and then opening the file though it's open. There's an error in the file, I just write the error out with that print. And otherwise, I use this IO copy to copy the file straight off the file system and on, onto the network connection. And because my file implements the reader interface and the connection implements the writer interface. And, sorry? Yeah, and so it's like that. It just happens. And the really neat thing is that uh, both the file interface and the connection interface also implement a send file target and send file, de uh, send file origin and send file target. So if you're running on a system that, like Linux that supports send file, it will actually use the kernel to read straight off the disk and bypass user space and send it straight down the wire. But at no point do I need to know anything about that. This code doesn't even care. It could be, if I was testing this, I could pass in a file and read from the file and write uh, to another file or something like that. So I'm almost out of time. I'll just go to conclusions. Um, I didn't mention this yet, but Go is open source. Um, it's fully open source. We began at Google uh, in private in 2007 as a little 20% project amongst the, the originators of the language. And then in November 2009, we released it under a BSD license. Um, and since its release, we've done all of our development in the open. And we have an open development mailing list as well as discussion mailing lists. Um, we do all of our code review in the open as well. And um, we have, uh, that number's actually old. We've got, I think, more than 250 non-Google contributors now. Um, and we have, and they've committed thousands of changes. Um, there's a full-time team, team of us at Google who are kind of leading the project um, and working on it full-time, um, myself included. And we also have several committers um, from the open source community who have like commit privileges, which doesn't doesn't mean that they don't get to uh, that it, that they don't need their code reviewed. What it means is that they actually own um, parts of the Go code base. There's somebody who works on Windows support, actually a couple of people. There's somebody who works on um, a lot of the networking stack. There's another guy who works on a lot of crypto, and these people also own parts of this. So it's not just a Google project; it's very much a community project. Um, and I spend a lot of my time working with people outside of Google almost as much as I do inside. Um, and so if you are sort of keen on working on a nascent um, technology and something that is, I, I believe, um, really a significant project, um, you're invited to be involved. Um, we're very sort of welcoming. We, you'll get really, really good code reviews, really good feedback. Um, and we're a very, very productive project as well. We do, do a tremendous amount of work. Um, and we do it very fast, but with very, very, very high standards. Um, so if that appeals to you, please um, come and check us out. Uh, this year we, we launched Go on App Engine. So it's really, really easy to write web apps and then deploy them um, on the App Engine platform. Um, it's by far the easiest way to get started with Go at the moment. You can just download the SDK. It includes everything that you need. You can follow the tutorials and so on. Um, my colleague here works on App Engine. Hooray. Um, and early next year, um, we plan to release Go version 1. Or 2012. Hmm? Yeah, that's when we announced the plan last month. Right. 
I misread it. Yeah, yeah. So we, we, we announced a plan for Go One in 2011. And then in, uh, and so the idea is, um, it will be a version of Go that you can write books about, that you can base a company on, that will be supported on the order of years. Um, and the plan resolves a range of little niggling things that were always kind of too hard or, you know, too significant a change. We didn't know when we were going to do them. Um, and so deciding to do Go One prompted us to make a lot of decisions. Um, as a project, as a community, and uh, the work is already underway. Um, most of the hard stuff's already been done, and we're looking at a release candidate early next year, hopefully launching early next year as well. So um, stay tuned for that. That's really exciting. Um, so if you want to learn about Go, uh, the best way to learn is the tour of Go, which I gave here in person yesterday, but is also available at tour.golang.org, and it's a fully interactive um, tour of the language. Um, which takes you through a number of examples and exercises, which you can um, edit and run code in this in this code box here. Um, and uh, you can go to golang.org or blog.golang.org, and there's lots of articles, documentation, tutorials, and so on. And uh, if you want to get started with Go on App Engine, rather than memorizing that URL, just search for Go App Engine. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them in the remaining four minutes. Otherwise, I can talk to you outside. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about what kinds of things Go is being used for internally at Google? Unfortunately, I can't really talk about what we use it for internally. I can say um, that there is some very large stuff that uses Go code when you type things in and things happen with Google products. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of uh, very high, high, high uh, throughput stuff that's running on Go. Yeah. Yeah, if I ever need to do anything in Python, I go to the yeah, thing, you type thing in thing first, you type Python, and then whatever I'm trying to do, you know, mm -hmm. embedded types in SQL3. If you do that with Go, you generally don't get any reference to Go at all in the first two or three pages of the search results. If you do, so if, you, way to if you write Go programming language, yes. and then the term, or Go lang, and then the term, or even Go language, and the term, it usually comes out well. Anybody else? Yeah, so the, there's a reflect package that lets you introspect Go data types at runtime. Um, and yeah, that's, that's how that works. It, it gets an idea of what the struct looks like and then looks for those fields. And the nice thing about that JSON thing is if you only want a small part of a large JSON block, it just throws everything else away and just scans over the stuff that it doesn't need. So you don't need to load it all into memory twice or so on. Well, here's the president for OSTC. Good luck. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks very much. Cool.